as a priest, I get to meet a lot of different people. And one of the great privileges of my life is when I meet uh, a good person. And you can tell a good person, you can sort of distinguish a good person because very often they'll inform you. If you're a priest, you know, I'll be sitting around somewhere and someone will start a conversation and they'll hear that I'm a priest. Oh, you're a priest. You know, I'm not religious. It's not like my thing, but like, but I'm a good person. And so they'll tell you when they're, when they're a good person. And usually right after that phrase, I'm a good person, there's a, there's a very strong justification for that, which is they'll say, I'm a good person. I never killed anybody. And I'm so pleased to finally meet somebody that hasn't killed anybody. And that's what a good person is, apparently. False, right? That's a very, very, very low bar. And yet, it's apparently the bar that is common enough that I've heard that, I've heard that exact phrase, I'm a good person, comma, I've never killed anybody, maybe 50 times from 50 different people. That is not the standard. Let's check out the standard here. We have this rich man that Jesus describes. And let's kind of start at the, in the middle here. I'm in anguish in this flame. Okay, so he's in anguish and flame. The word here is Hades, but it's the place of the dead. It's just a Greek word for Sheol or for the place of the dead. But he's being punished. We'll call it hell. What did that guy do to deserve that? to deserve anguish and flames. Did he kill anybody? <coughs> no, he didn't, not technically. He did not murder Lazarus. And yet, oddly enough, even though he didn't kill anybody, which means he's a good person, he's still being tormented in the afterlife. So he didn't directly kill Lazarus. Did he starve Lazarus intentionally? Lazarus, it's, it, we have every reason to believe that he starved. In any case, he died uh, close enough to him. He didn't, I mean, it's, it doesn't say that. I don't think we have any reason to believe that the rich man wanted Lazarus to die. In fact, he would have lost nothing. Lazarus probably would have survived. He desired just the crumbs that fell from his table. So the rich guy would have lost nothing. It would have taken literally zero effort for him to feed Lazarus. So, we have no reason to believe that he intended or that he wished for Lazarus to start. So why is he in hell then? He's in hell because he didn't notice that Lazarus was there. He's not in hell because he killed anybody, and he's not in hell because he wished harm on anybody. He's in hell because he didn't notice somebody he could have helped. called the sin of omission, right? When we don't do something that we're supposed to do. And a sin of omission earned this wealthy man hell. You see how the standard that Jesus gives us is way different than the standard of, I'm a good person, I never killed anyone. The fact is, somebody died because he didn't notice. Now, it doesn't always have to be this life or death dramatic thing. That's the standard. Now, the next question becomes, okay, why didn't that rich man notice? And Jesus gives us, I think, enough, enough clues to figure this out. Let's kind of work through this. What is it that caused the rich man to not notice a man starving literally on his porch? How, do, how does somebody become that spiritually blind? that self-absorbed, so self-absorbed that they don't even notice somebody dying in front of their eyes. Let's look at the details. There was a rich man. I don't think that's it. I know. Jesus does have a, lots of warnings for rich people that they have a higher responsibility to take care of the poor and so on. I don't think that's what earned hell. It's not a sin to be rich. And, and being rich doesn't automatically make you selfish and blind to the needs of others. So that's not it. He was clothed in purple. It's not my favorite color, but I don't think that's the cause of selfishness, is wearing purple. Fine linen. It's interesting to think about the fact that probably the, the best possible clothing.
cloth you could have gotten in Jesus' time, if you were the richest person in the world, is probably not quite as good as very, very cheap stuff that we use, that we have today. So I hope wearing good quality uh, cloth is not the thing that makes us selfish. Feasted sumptuously. I really hope that's not the problem. Because I'm hungry and I'm going to feast sumptuously after Mass at some point. It's, so what's the problem? None of these things individually is what caused that man to be selfish. But I think the next phrase is. He was clothed in purple and fine linen and he feasted sumptuously every day. I think that's the beginning of the problem. His day-to-day -day activity was partying and having fun. And if you want to ask me what is it that causes somebody to become so selfish that they forget about everybody else in the world, having fun and partying every day. That will make you selfish. If that is your life, you are already a selfish person. And I'm telling you right now, there is a Lazarus in your life that you're not even noticing. There's time. I mean, by no means think that I'm saying never have fun and, and like recreate. That's not at all what, what the point is. The point is, this was every single day. So let's do a little bit of math. If enjoyment and just sort of getting what you want is 100%, that means, just mathematically speaking, that is zero left for God and zero left for your neighbor. Now, it doesn't always have to be having fun. It could also be making money in order to have fun. It doesn't always have to be, I'm literally partying 24-7. No, if you're working and partying, and if that makes up all of your time, you're the same as this rich guy. One seventh, let's just do some math. One seventh is supposed to be holy and consecrated to God. One seventh of the week, right? The Sabbath day. That means it's not for you and your fun, it's for God. And then money wise, one tenth. In the Old Testament, it was given this 10%. You were supposed to take of your earnings and give to the poor. So one-seventh of your time is for God. One-tenth of your money is for your neighbor. We'll just be, be playful and we'll add those up. You, you end up with 0.248 and some, some other numbers. It's about a quarter, about one-fourth. Just consider that that is not for you. One-fourth of you and your life does not belong to you. A part of you belongs to God. The best part of you. Not a lot, it's a seventh, one seventh. But that belongs to God and nobody else. One seventh of your heart, whatever that number means. I'm just being playful using numbers, but it might help. But there's some portion of you that is for God and nobody else, and that's you as a human being. Not even you as a Catholic, this is Old Testament stuff. So yes, there are people that dedicate themselves 100% to God. That's not asked of everybody. One seventh is asked of everybody. There's some portion of you that is meant to be holy and and if that's not there, you are doing something unjust. You are not giving God what He deserves. And there's a tenth of you, minimum, that belongs to love of neighbor. And if you're not doing that, you're doing something unjust. And if you want to think of it in terms of how much time you dedicate, how much effort you dedicate, Whatever that, whatever helps, but there has to be some portion of you that isn't about you. Is that asking too much? At the beginning, maybe it sounds harsh. The guy just sort of didn't notice something, and now he's in hell. That doesn't seem fair, but it is. It's very fair. Because the fact is, all he did was not notice, and somebody died because of that. And he didn't notice because he didn't give that tenth of his heart to his neighbor. And he didn't give that seventh of his heart to God. So it's, I'm going to end with sort of two questions. First, start to think about, start to reflect who Lazarus might be for you. Who is it that you're not noticing? That maybe, maybe they're not going to physically die, but maybe spiritually, maybe emotionally. All they need is a crumb. Maybe it's your own kids. Maybe providing a house isn't enough. Maybe they need a smile once in a while. Maybe they need a hug. 
just a crumb, it's not going to cost you anything. Maybe it's a friend that's in need that you're just sort of not noticing, you're not realizing they need you because of the stuff, because you're absorbed with your own thing. Who might that be for you? Maybe it's your parents, maybe it's your grandparents. And again, it's not going to cost you anything. Maybe it's just a couple minute phone call. Who is it that you're not noticing that maybe spiritually is dying and could be given life just with something that won't cost you anything? But this last thing I want to say is there's a, there's a big irony here. Really kind of like almost humorous, if we can laugh at ourselves. The big irony is this. We're the ones that are dying. And we're the ones that are starving. God is the one who's rich. And God is the one that's offering us the best banquet on the face of the earth, which is his own body and blood. And even if we're not, you know, at mass, we have a chapel that's open 24 hours. Christ is on our porch like Lazarus, but he's the one who's rich. And still we're ignoring him. We're the ones that are starving, and we're ignoring the rich man that could give us the nourishment that we need. Weird irony that we have here. So let's turn that around. It's good intention to have this week. Pay attention. Who is Lazarus to me in regards to my neighbor? Who is it that I could give life to with just a little bit of attention? And then remember that you're Lazarus too. And go to the rich man who is not selfish and who doesn't seek after only his own pleasure, but who's very abundant. Go to him and even the crumbs that fall from his table, the Eucharist, will give us life in ways that are more abundant than we can imagine.